Here we go. After awesome. a year there we go. that I got that figured out. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We're all still kind of in the Zoom, post Zoom world, right? Um, cool. So, um, well, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. Can you start off by telling me a little bit about um, the NOPO for the people who are listening who are unfamiliar with the brand? Sure, of course. Um, the NOPO is an end to end platform that's empowering artisans, exceptional artisans worldwide to participate in e-commerce and in international e-commerce. Uh, really what we're doing is providing all the tools that are necessary for them to overcome, I would say all the barriers that are preventing them from participating in international e-commerce today. Uh, just to clarify, artisans are what you call highly skilled crafters and makers. Uh, we're focusing specifically on home decor and fashion accessories. Uh, there are 200 million artisans around the world with over 65% of them in the developing world, and they don't have access to the same sort of tools, the same sort of solutions that are available for artisans in, in, in the Western world. Uh, so what the NOPO is really doing is helping them overcome those barriers, uh, which are logistical barriers, international shipping and international payment processing, language barriers, so really helping them to communicate their value in a way that would be uh, compelling to an American customer, um, and the trust barrier, which is really probably a, a very human inherent flaw in all of us when you're transacting with someone from a different country with a different language, there's always that uncertainty. So what we're doing is bringing online a huge selection of beautiful, unique, handmade items from the best artisans around the world. Amazing. So um, can you talk a little bit about what, how you as a company define e-commerce and digital commerce, what it means for your, also sort of for your community, because it sounds like you're working with a lot of, um, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, the first aspect is really about democratizing opportunities. So I would say tearing down those boundaries that are preventing people uh, from participating in international e-commerce and, and just allowing them to come online and transact with people uh, from different places and being rewarded for the value that they're created, creating. And I think the other aspect of it is really about uh, broadening the boundaries of, of e-commerce and almost redefining it as an inspirational form of entertainment. I think today people are looking to connect to what they're buying in a much deeper level. Uh, they want to understand who they're buying it from. They want to understand the process of the creation. Um, and we're really trying to transport our customers almost to the other side of the world. Um, so it's really about you know, democratizing opportunities on the one hand, but also redefining what e-commerce means. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, I imagine with so many interesting makers and artisans that probably storytelling plays a big part. And as you talked, I love that you use this word entertainment because we don't always think of entertainment in e-commerce, you know, but there is this opportunity with e-commerce to really connect to both, you know, where you're buying from, who is wearing something, what the story is around that. Um, and obviously there being a purpose in wanting to support artisans worldwide um, with their creations. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Wow, I mean, that's, that's a huge issue. I mean, I definitely believe that the future belongs to those who will be able to tell the story in the most compelling, the most intelligent, the most authentic way. But it's also, it's a huge challenge. And it's something that we're actually dealing with right now is we're developing our new platform, which is how do you tell that story in the most transformative way and really get people, you know, enveloped in the experience, but at the same time, not divert their attention from what they're here to do, which is to buy something for their home or buy a gift for someone that they love. And I think you really have to strike that balance between incredible storytelling on the one hand and really getting them inside the, you know, the experience, but on the other hand, getting them to do what they want to do. Um, so it's, it's a huge challenge. We're working with, you know, with our artisans all the time. Um, a lot of times people don't really know how to tell their story um, as well. Is, you know, so we're really also having to work what is that format that can make it much more, again, um, independent, more authentic so that they can tell their story um, on their own independently. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of coach them and guide them and give them the tools to help them craft Right. So it's on the one hand, it's, you know, how did they tell their own story? But at the same time, it's how do we put that onto one platform and create that stage and create that experience. But at the same time, you know, take the customer through the journey that they want to come. You know, when, when they come onto the platform, they're coming also to be inspired, but they want to make a purchase at the end of the day. And you really have to work 
um, and creating that very, very delicate balance. Sure, absolutely. So with these two groups that you're working with, both your audience and customers, and then with your artisans and sellers, um, how do they find you? Uh, well, you know, I think we're really, one of the things that we're doing really well uh, is creating community. So in the beginning, first of all, you know, the first artisan is a great story. I mean, it, it took us about two weeks to find our first artisan. We were searching 24-7. Um, and I think that just goes to show how difficult it is to access these artisans. You know, you want to find these people that really have a unique voice, that have unique inventory, um, that are really creating high quality products and that they're aligned with your values. And it's just so hard to find them. They're invisible online. Some of our artisans do have some sort of, you know, website, but it's so localized that you just, you're never going to find it when you're looking at it on regular search engines. So the first artisan was really a struggle to find. But once we found that first artisan, it was the network effect in its most purest form because he introduced us to another two artisans from his clique and they introduced us to another four artisans and we were, you know, reaching out to new, uh, bigger, you know, clusters from around the country. And we did this all remotely. Um, initially, when we had, you know, had our plan, you know, all set, we were planning on going to, our first destination was Morocco, our second destination was Mexico. And we were planning to travel to these countries, take a guide, have him, you know, take us through the streets, knock on doors, introduce ourselves and, and convince people that, you know, this is a great platform. Uh, but we couldn't travel because of COVID. And we just had to find other ways of doing this remotely. And so it was really the community of the artisans that allowed us to grow and to get the artisans. And I think it's very much the same with, you know, with our customers. So we're doing all the traditional um, marketing shticks, but when it comes to really finding those loyal customers, the ones that are most excited about what you're doing, it's really the strongest, the strongest way of getting to them is word of mouth. So people that are so excited about, you know, what they found and them referring, you know, their friends, their brothers and sisters, their mothers, um, that seems to really be working very, very well. And one of the ways that we're doing this is really engaging our customers by telling them, you know, just making sure that they know the story of the artisans and also bringing their story online as well. Because I think, you know, there's, there's so much to learn from each other. Um, this is really a community of people that are uh, bounded by this passion for for creativity, um, for self-expression. And so when we find a customer who's willing to share their story, that's just as important for us. And so on our social media, we'll share photos of you know, the products of the artisans in their new home, which is always something that's very excited for the artisans as well. But it just gets their community much more engaged and involved. And we tell their story, which is many times just as inspiring as the ones as the artisans. That's so interesting. And so um, how, uh, when you talk about your traditional marketing channels, are you, you know, doing email, social media, search, um, you know, how are you being discovered? And are you doing anything with influencers? Like talk about mm -hmm. what your, what your media right. looks like. So, I mean, there's this whole kind of like pie of, of, of different channels that, that we're uh, focusing on. So of course there's paid media through, you know, Facebook and Instagram. Um, Pinterest seems to be something that's been working really well for us because again, people that go on Pinterest are looking for that inspiration. They're looking for that special item, um, something that, you know, creates this long lasting satisfaction gratification, not just for the functionality of the product itself. Um, but in addition to that, we are, uh, of course, email marketing is a very important channel for us. Uh, we, we have a lot of content on our platform. So not only do we have this, you know, the bios of the artisans, but we have our magazine where we tell the stories of the artisans, but also share inspiration about the country. So, you know, what are the five best Moroccan brunches and the dishes to go with them or the best designed little boutique hotels or riads in Morocco or Mexico. Um, so it really invites the people to come back again and again to the platform, but it's helpful also in terms of generating that organic traffic. So, you know, we'll publish an article and we'll see like a couple months later, people are still coming in to read that specific article. And it's not only necessarily because they're looking to shop for something, but because they're looking for inspiration, whether it's their planning a trip somewhere or they're daydreaming about a trip somewhere or they're just trying to create that great Moroccan brunch for their friends. Uh, so uh, just like organic traffic around content is something that's super, super important for us. Um, we do have a great ambassador program. So uh, we work with people, we call them um, influential people and not influencers. 
uh, because these are people that are not doing this for their income. These are people that are, you know, they, they just happen to be very influential because they're great artists, you know, artists themselves or creators themselves. They do have a great following. So anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000 followers. Um, and they just love the concept. They love the idea of connecting with artisans in other places around the world. Um, and those sort of collaborations that are really authentic, uh, those themes to be, you know, they are really bringing in the, I would say, the real customers that are going to be excited about what we're doing. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's a combination and we really have to work on all of these fronts at the same time to really leverage it um, and create this synergy. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting you're talking about leveraging all of that content as well because it's so rich, it sounds like, um, and that's content strategy is really driving people in and building the connections and then transforming into sales and transactions. So it's really a storytelling led process versus say just product marketing. Um, when we were just starting out, we didn't spend any money on paid media, media at all because we were still mm -hmm. kind of trying to understand, you know, who our customers would be, what our messaging would be. And we still wanted to get that traffic to the site. So we did start out just with the magazine and started placing our articles in all sorts of Facebook groups that were discussing travel and culture and design and lifestyle. And that brought in all our first transactions and our first traffic. The rest of the transactions that came in actually came in through the network of the artisans. So, um, you know, every artisan on our platform does have some sort of Instagram account. Some have 20,000 followers, some have 2,000 followers. But among them, there's this huge community of people that again, they have this shared appreciation for what these people are doing. And it was so beautiful to see because sometimes we would have a customer who would come in to purchase an item from one specific um, artisan, but would end up buying from a few other artisans at the same time. And so also our artisans understood the power of this network, the power of this community, and started also supporting each other and resharing stories about each other. And that seemed to be super, super effective. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So how was that impacted by the pandemic? Were you seeing an increase in traffic or people shopping more online? I know some companies were registering that. Yeah, I mean- Can you COVID, talk about your experience? Right, so COVID was, created a lot of challenges. Um, you know, we were just starting out. Um, my co-founder and I couldn't meet in person for, for many months. Our plans to travel uh, were, were disposed, but it created a lot of opportunities. And I think one of the greatest opportunities was very ironically, it created this huge intimacy with their artisans when we were bringing them on board. Um, and the reason for this is because when you were talking with people over Zoom, you were invited into their homes. And in the background, you saw their kids running, um, you see like a, 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 a newborn that, you know, you would never have had that sort of interaction with a person if you would have met them in their, you know, solely professional um, environment. Um, mm -hmm. And it really created this very um, deep conversation. Everybody felt like we were in the same boat. Um, and it just allowed us to, you know, really communicate with the artisans. And it was hours and hours and hours of conversation that helped us perfect our business model and help us understand what, you know, what challenges we wanna address that will really provide value for these artisans. So that was something that was very, very helpful. And in terms of the customers, I mean, absolutely. People were spending a lot more time at home, staring at their blank walls, hoping that, you know, or dreaming that the space that they live in would remind them a little bit more of the beautiful, you know, charming hotel that they spent, you know, last summer at in Mexico. Um, and people were looking for inspiration and for deeper connection. So mm -hmm. it was, we felt that that was really creating an opportunity. And I'm glad to say that this is something that we see that will continue. Um, people have shifted their priorities. People are, are, you know, moving to working more at home, spending more time at home, understanding that their home is their haven. Um, and just really trying to fill it with things that create that sense of gratification and satisfaction. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities in the e-commerce space right now as we kind of head out of the pandemic, at least mm -hmm. in you know, the United States? Um, well, I think, you know, there's, there are a lot of challenges, of course. I think for us, uh, what I mentioned before is probably the most interesting challenge and that is how do you create this new sort of customer experience um, that is bringing people and you know just creating something that is so exciting that is so transformative that really gives them the sensation that they're being part of something that's much bigger than themselves but at the same time 
staying, you know, uh, very on, on top of your goals. Um, we don't want people to be, there's, there's so much noise. There is so much information around. Um, and you just have to find that, that perfect balance that will give them that exceptional experience on the one hand, you know, those, that experience that really gives you goosebumps. And you know that when you see a product that you just love, or, you, you know, you, you, that, that's the kind of thing that we want to create, but at the same time, you know, you do have to be, um, you can't, you, you want to make sure that they're not lost in the process. And I think that that's the greatest challenge. Uh, and it comes together with everything else. You know, people are now going out of their homes and everybody is so hungry for life. Um, and there, and that creates a lot of, um, a lot of noise, a lot of, um, you know, a diversion. There's so much to do. There's so much to experience. And that's going to be a challenge to get them to kind of focus and, 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 um, and take part in this journey that we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in terms of for your community, though, I imagine as your community grows, that you are now, do you have more artisans and more partners to work with to then who could potentially bring in their audiences as well? Absolutely. I mean, we see this all the time. We do live events on Instagram. So that always brings in, you know, their audience as well. We'll always see sales after, um, you know, an, an event like that. Uh, we get amazing reactions. People get really excited about hearing the story behind it. Um, we've also done, started doing um, like live events, uh, live sales. So um, for instance, we have this great rug curator in Morocco. She lives in the Eureka Valley. It's an hour and a half in Marrakesh and the most gorgeous you know, uh, view right outside of her gallery. And what we did was we invited our customers to sort of like a, an introduction Q&A session where they could really hear the stories behind every rug. Um, and at the end of it, they could actually, at the end of the session, they would turn their camera to their, you know, the room that they're looking for a carpet or a rug for and ask this curator, well, is, do you have something specific that you recommend for this space? And to really create this engagement. And, and this is especially important when you're talking about what's a considered purchase. So things that are more expensive, things that, you know, have set a real huge impact on a room. And um, those are the things that people are a little bit, you know, weary about buying online and to create that sort of um, interaction is something that is is, is great. Um, so that's definitely something that uh, we're working more on developing. Um, and again, you have to create the tools, you have to create the format, um, and you've got to train or educate the artisans to do it in a way that will really be effective. So that's something that we're really focusing on right now. I love the idea that you're doing that because just like bringing, and, and I feel like that pandemic has made us all be more creative online in ways that we can bring things together. Because like you said, I mean, you have this woman who's in this beautiful valley outside of Marrakesh um, who might be connecting with customers, you know, in Japan or in London or something. And for the first time, and then to actually have then not just that, turn the camera on their home and say, oh, how, find me a rug. Those kinds of connections are just invaluable. Yeah. And um, I love that it happened so spontaneously the first time. And then after it was like, okay, this is something that you do. You know, if you have, you know, you can, you can just so easily turn your camera and just get that, you know, that free consultation. Um, and again, it creates that great engagement um, and creates trust really. And especially when, you know, when we're trying to bridge cultures, trying to bridge worlds, that connection is super important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can imagine. So, um, you know, talk about how, what, how innovations are important to your brand and what kinds of other innovations you're working on. Um, uh, so, you know, as a marketplace, we have, I would say three customers. We've got the people who are buying the products. We've got the artisans themselves who need a whole area of services and tools. And then there's us, the company, the back end, the logistics, which is very, very complicated. And this is something that we took on ourselves, which is very, it's not trivial in this world. Again, international shipping and international payment processing is a huge challenge, but we knew that if we didn't tackle this challenge, we were not gonna really be able to help these um, vendors. And so we had to really, I would say uh, develop innovative solutions throughout the supply chain that would make it um, possible for us to source, to curate, and then deliver these items at scale to the other side of the world. Um, so each in each one of these fronts, we've got a lot of things um, that we have to do, a lot of great challenges, that the only way to really solve them is through technology. Um, I'd say technology and human connection, because we always have that human element in it, but it's, it's about technology. Um, one aspect, which is very interesting in marketplaces, just, you know, the onboarding of your vendors is, is very, it's, it's a long process. It takes a lot of effort. 
Um, in many cases, it requires either, you know, your own, um, you know, manpower hours or, you know, just um, training or educating the vendors. In this aspect, what we're trying to really do is create an onboarding experience for them that is not only intuitive and easy in many different languages, but also, um, I would say, fun, you know, um, mm -hmm almost gamified experience. Um, so that's something that we're really working hard on because as we scale, we just have to really be able to shorten the process um, and uh, divert our attention to where it really matters, which is more about the curation um, rather than you know just the technical onboarding aspect. So we really have to find a way of doing it, again, that people around the world, different languages, different cultures, different you know, social nuances can all understand how to do it um, and do it very quickly. Um, and, and I'll just say, you know, we're not working here with, um, you know, vendors that have this business acumen. These are creative souls. Uh, they're a one, I would say one woman show in most cases. Um, they, there's so much on their plate right now. Um, and we really want them to focus entirely on the creative process. So just being able to unburden them and take off all the logistics and all the operational aspects of it is something that's going to be just super helpful for them. And so technology has to come um, there as well. So again, in terms of the customers, I think mostly about the experiences and making as interactive and as transformative as possible. In terms of the logistics, it's really finding that innovation, innovative solutions throughout the supply chain. And when it comes to the artisans, it's just making the onboarding experience as fun and as easy and as intuitive as possible. I can imagine. And it just the logistics you explained um, sounds so complicated. And particularly, I know last year was not an easy one to be trying to get things from one side of the world to the other and um, and so forth. So I'm pleased to hear that you're innovating in that area and mm -hmm. um, will continue to do so. I hope it will get easier for you. Um, so as you talk about this whole one woman show and these small artisans you're working with, I imagine that there's a lot of um, purpose behind what they do and that among your clientele that in your, um, you know, who are consumers now are looking more for purpose, you know, to shop their purpose, basically, they want to spend money with organizations that they want to support and not just, you know, for sure. certain kinds of places. So they really want to know that their dollars are being spent for useful um, um, Brand. So can you talk about what role purpose plays in your marketing and for your brand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, just like as a general point, I mean, we are seeing a renaissance in the whole handcraft market. Um, today, the handcraft market is valued at over $250 billion. Um, that's offline and online. But of course, we see a migration more and more onto online. And really, the driving force behind that is the millennial generation that is just now entering their you know, prime spending years, they have a lot more disposable income and they are buying their commodities on Amazon. But when it comes to buying something special for themselves, for their homes, for someone that they love, then it's really important for them that it reflects their individuality, that it reflects their values, that it reflects their worldview. Um, and nothing like a handmade item that really gives you that value add. And they're willing to pay a premium for that. They understand, you know, if you're gonna pay, buy something that's handmade, highly skilled uh, craftsmen, crafts work um, that's you know fair trade that's sustainable they're willing to pay that premium because it really what they're buying it's not just or I would say like our unit value is not just a product it's not just the functionality of the product it's really the experience and the story that comes along with it and that's exactly what creates that long lasting sense of gratification um, you know we've all experienced that when we've traveled abroad and found this you know sweet artisan and in, 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 in you know some sort of alleyway that you we accidentally kind of bumped into and bring that home with us. And it means to us so much more than just, you know, what, you know, how beautiful it is or how um, unique it is. It really comes with that sense of, of this, the story, the passion, the ingenuity that went into creating this product. Um, and that's really what we're about. Uh, it was something, you know, it was a dilemma at the beginning. How much of, uh, how, uh, how much at the forefront do you actually put the artisans? Um, you know, every marketplace has the issue of leakage, right? You know, once it's very, very difficult to find these artisans, but once we say, you know, this is their name, you know, this is their story, this is their Instagram account, it's very easy to communicate with them afterwards and, and shop off the platform. Um, and really what we're doing is I think we're creating so much value both for the artisans and for the customers that it really just makes sense to continue um, the, the interaction, the transaction on the platform itself. Um, and 
that was, I mean, that's super important for us and from the very first day. It was about, you know, being fair and about being transparent and about creating value. And we knew that as long as we're creating value for every, all our stakeholders, whether it's customers or artisans, what once, you know, we're being transparent and fair in our pricing model, then it's going to be okay. We're going to manage and, and we're seeing that. We're seeing, you know, repeat purchases. We're seeing loyal customers. Uh, we're seeing artisans that, you know, are sticking with us um, and really appreciate um, the stage that they're getting and the opportunity they're getting. Um, you know, we're not an NGO, we're a for-profit organization, but we're still creating this huge, you know, this really deep connection with our artisans and really feel like we're building an amazing community around it. Um, and we get these calls all the time when we put a story of an artisan in our article, literally, you know, people with tears in their eyes, you know, are thanking us for helping, you know, helping share their story, helping giving, the, you know, creating that stage. Um, and I think people all around are appreciating that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're sort of building these connections. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I imagine for the clientele that the curation plays a, an important role. And, um, you know, because they're not finding these people on their own and may appreciate that you're there as this hub and um, source to find this beautiful art and these unique yeah. individuals. Um, can you talk about the importance of curation? I'll start with a quote from one of our customers who said to me, um, that you know, she finds on the platform all the things she imagines she'll find when she's traveling abroad, but never finds them because they're never in the, you know the main street of the market, um, and and that's really what what it's about. We're you know trying to bring under one roof all the most you know the most beautiful, really the exceptional artisans. So you know I was talking before about democratizing e-commerce, and that's really what we're about. But at the same time, it's not for everybody. It's really for the exceptional artisans, the people that put you know their heart and soul into it. They're highly skilled, and that's the kind of platform that we're trying to create. Um, curation uh, has different aspects to it. We have different stages throughout the onboarding process where we really can validate uh, the quality. We're, we're looking at two things. First of all, the quality and the uniqueness of the products, but also um, at their values. Uh, making sure that, you know, if they're hiring other artisans, they're, you know, you know um, uh, it's fair trade, uh, making sure that they're using sustainable products. So those are things that we're also looking at in the curation process. But one of the things that also was really helpful in that respect is the fact that we're using the network uh, is our first filter because the artisans are so proud to be part of, uh, of a platform that is really, you know, uh, promoting the select high quality items. And so when they refer another artisan to us, it's very important for them to, uh, to really maintain this level of quality. And so they'll never refer, will never recommend to us someone who's not, um, who they wouldn't be proud to be associated with. Um, so that was something that was very, very helpful for us. Yeah, that's so interesting, I can imagine. Um, can you talk about what is top of mind for you as you prepare for the back half of 2021? Um, so yeah, I mean, during, you know, the last uh, few months, it was really about getting more traffic to the site, creating more awareness, uh, creating credibility to the brand. Um, and now we're more about, you know, trying to create that lifetime value, repeat purchases, uh, really trying to understand, first of all, who are those core customers that are going to come back again and again. They're, you know, our biggest supporters, they're their most outspoken ambassadors. Um, and that's something that we're really trying to focus much more attention on. Again, learning who those people are, talking to them as much as possible, bringing them back as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you're not doing now that you hope, would hope to be doing soon that you're interested in to grow? A lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have such a big vision and there's so many things that we want to do. And of course, we have to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, specifically, you know, focusing on marketing we're not speaking as much as I would like to, to our customers. Every time we do speak with them, it is so insightful. Uh, we learn so much and we improve. Um, and it's, it's hard, first of all, because it never seems to be the most burning, urgent um, issue you know, in, on the agenda, even though we know we want to do it. Um, so just creating the time for it. Um, and the other aspect is, is really getting people to, to create the time to speak with you. So, you know, it's one thing to be a very loyal customer and, you know, write a great review. It's another thing to create the time for a conversation. So that's something that I definitely uh, have to want to focus on more um, in, in the near future. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and what are some ways that you guys are entering the marketplace and differentiating yourselves from other sites that do sell crafted mm -hmm. goods like an Etsy or something yeah. like that? 
Um, well, there are different, many different, um, I would say differentiators, but probably the two main ones is we talked about curation. Mm -hmm. So being a highly curated platform um, to really enhance the customer experience so that when you come into the platform, you know that, you know, you might not, you know, not necessarily everything is exactly to your taste, but you know that it's going to be high quality. You know that it's going to be aligned with your values. And the second is about creating true global reach. Um, so we're talking about in the beginning about really breaking down, tearing down those barriers, you know, the platforms out there like Shopify, uh, Wix, WooCommerce, they're doing a great job in terms of democratizing e-commerce and really giving small vendors the opportunity to create that storefront. Mm -hmm. um, but what we found is that it is more conducive to local e-commerce. And when you're talking about international e-commerce, it doesn't address the most urgent needs that vendors have, These, especially when we're talking about small players. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we're really putting a lot of, of focus on right now. So it's, it's, really creating that true global reach. So, I mean, just Etsy, again, is a great platform and, and I'm a customer. Um, when, you know, 90% of their vendors are from either the North America, Western Europe, Australia, um, they do have some vendors uh, from the developing world, but again, these are not validated. It's a zero screening platform. So you don't know if what you're getting is really the original thing. And if that's something that's important to you, you wanna make sure that it was actually handmade and not manufactured. If you wanna know the story behind the person, um, if you wanna know that again, it's aligned with your standards of quality and your values, then it's gonna be a lot more difficult for you to find what you want on one of those platforms. That makes so much sense. Um, I'm curious, as you were talking about globally um, marketing the network, um, what are some of the different challenges you find in different markets? And are you, you know, do you have to deal with different languages? And I imagine, I know in different countries that certain kinds of payment systems, some people love Klarna and Twint and then other people just want PayPal and Visa. And, you know, what does it look like from a cultural point of view um, with these varying ways of communicating in payment systems? We know when we're just in our MVP stage, then we started out, we launched in Morocco, and then about six months later, we launched in Mexico. And one of the reasons that we decided to, to launch so quickly in a new destination, even though we were, you know, there was so much more to do in Morocco, was because we really wanted to validate our model. Uh, we were, you know, we were in the process of writing out our playbook. What does it mean to, you know, start it, open a new destination? Uh, how do you find the artisans? How do you communicate? You know, what are the nuances? But what we did find is that there's a there's much more in common um, than there is, uh, than, you know, that there's different in terms of culture, in terms of really talking to people, in terms of what, you know, what's important to them. Uh, maybe one of the reasons for that is that most of our vendors on our platform, what we call the new generation of artisans. These are people that have universal values. They've traveled the world. They want to be part of the world. Um, and in that case, there's, I think, more commonality between them than, than what divides them. But yeah, in terms of logistics, there are definitely different needs in each country. So just for an example, in Morocco, if you want to open up a PayPal account, you have to be a registered uh, business and you have to open up a business account in one specific bank. So it's a very heavy bureaucratic process. Many of our vendors are not a registered business. Um, and so it does create complexities. And so you do have to be able to fine tune your model to every destination that you're launching. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing it one destination at a time to make sure that we're doing the process in a way that's really going to be cost effective. It's going to be beneficial to everyone around um, and really perfecting it before we move on to the next destination. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure that's just so complicated. And what are some of the new destinations that you're interested in entering? So uh, we're launching Colombia in August, which is really exciting. They have amazing things. I mean, that's part of the best thing of what we're doing. Like we get so excited. Every week we have new artisans onboarding new products and you know, everybody, all our team, it just gets goosebumps from the beautiful products that we're bringing on. Um, and Israel is going to be at the, uh, towards the end of the year. Fantastic. Um, excellent. Well, I think we're getting to the end of our hour now. Um, unless we have any questions from the audience, I don't see any audience questions, but I'll give the audience just a second to <laughs> um, tell me about the piece that's behind you. Is this something? Um, so you see the three tiles. They're mm -hmm. actually by an artisan uh, um, uh, called the the company's called Zellar Zina Beneni is the artisan. Um, and she's did something really magnificent. Um, Zellage tiles is, is, you know, ancient techniques of working with tiles. And you, when you go around Morocco, you see all the beautiful buildings with, with these tiles all around them. 
Um, and it's a very male dominated um, field. And in fact, there isn't any um, academic institution where, you, or, you know, there isn't really any formal institution where you can study this. And she felt that this was a, a something that she had to do. She was so passionate about it. And she just found this um, older artisan who kind of took her under his wing and she would just spend hours with him learning this and she took this whole um, tradition very very traditional uh, craft work and she modernized it um, so she she's has a lot of great different tiles some of them are very you know cheeky fun um, and she's really just breathing new breathing new life into this very ancient tradition wow it's such a beautiful piece and it's a great story <laughs> Um, okay, we just have one question from the audience, and that is, what is your favorite marketing campaign that you've worked on? Wow. You know, we're tapping into the most community, uh, most creative population on earth. Um, and all of the creative that we use for our performance marketing is always from, it's, it's basically, it's UGC, right? It's all uh, content that the artisans themselves are creating. So I'm afraid I can't say I have a favorite. It's just, it's exciting every time to get more and more, you know, um, you know whether it's videos, whether it's photo shoots that we get from the artisans themselves. Um, and, and that's, it's incredible because again, we're putting them at the front almost every time. That's, you know, that's the story that we're telling. That's our messaging. It's really just about connecting them and, and, and creating the stage for them. Mm -hmm. So it's artisan led um, storytelling and just, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. That was, this was fun. <laughs> a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. And I've got to go to the Nopo now and <laughs> check it out. <laughs> yes, Thank check you. out the Nopo.com. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly and Diana, for closing our day on the future of retail and e-commerce. Kelly, it was so amazing to hear how you created a platform that allows consumers to explore beyond their physical boundaries while still shopping consciously and sustainably. I can't wait to see how the Nopo continues to grow. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Everyone. Thanks, you guys. Today was a great day of speakers, and we're excited for all of our upcoming days on this topic as we see how retail and e-commerce continue to evolve coming out of the pandemic. Um, we hope you all will join Brand Innovators tomorrow on June 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern for the first day of the Brand Innovators 10th anniversary Behind the Brand Summit. We will be joined by marketing leaders from Walmart Plus, E-Trade, Cadillac, Nissan US, Electronic Arts, and many more. Thank you for joining everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye.